ahead and get started now while you let still let people in. All right, um, so hello. Uh, welcome to the Astro Seminar, the first one of the online seminar series hosted by the Astrochemistry Subdivision of the American Chemical Society. I'm Partha Bera. I'm the 2020-2021 Chair of the Astrochemistry <laughs> Subdivision. I'm joined by uh, Chair-elect Heather Abor, past Chair Ryan Fortenberry, and Secretary David Woon. You will see one of us host this monthly seminar via Zoom on the second Wednesday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific. Each month, there will be two speakers. The seminar will start with a contributed talk for 15 minutes, followed by Q&A. This will be followed by an invited talk for about 30 minutes or so, followed by Q&A. Please visit our website to find out more about upcoming seminars and the recordings of past seminars. I would also encourage you to contribute talks. To do that, please go to the website and fill in the Google form in there and submit, and we will get back to you. At this point, I'll uh, take this opportunity to highlight an online series, seminar series that is or being organized by Dr. Brett McGuire et al. Uh, and it's called the Astrochemistry Discussions. They have lined up quite a number of uh, very few, very good and interesting talks. So uh, the next one is on the 23rd of September and it will be presented by Dr. Ted Bergen. So please uh, check that out and it'll be at 1400 uh, UTC. So uh, please do check, uh, check them out. Continuous uh, speakers through, throughout the fall. Let me also give a shout out to the folks at UCF, Brian Ferrari and Katya Slavosinska for conducting a series of wonderful talks uh, throughout this summer. Now today, we have two outstanding speakers. The first talk will be presented by Dr. Andrew Turner. Andrew is the, of uh, University of Hawaii, actually. Andrew is the 2020 Astrochemistry Subdivision Dissertation Award winner. And he will speak about phosphorus chemistry in astrophysical ISIS. Today's second talk, will be presented by Professor Alexander Tielens of Leiden University and the University of Maryland. Professor Tielens has practiced astronomy and astrochemistry for over four decades in various disciplines of astronomy and he has worked in NASA and the universities of Groningen, California, Leiden, and Maryland among others. He has written hundreds of important research papers and has written the <clears throat> authoritative book on physics and chemistry of interstellar media. From of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. <clears throat> and in 2012, he received the highest distinction in Dutch science, the Spinoza Prize. Zander will present an overview talk of the molecular universe. So before I hand it over to our first speaker, just a quick rem reminder, please your, uh, please your voice and your video off for the duration of the talk. If you have questions, please put the question down in the chat box and we will read it out to the, to the speakers at the end of the talk. And so with that, uh, let me hand it over to our first speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Andrew Turner. Andrew, start sharing, please. Okay. okay. Yeah. This works. All right. Everyone see my screen? 
Yes. Okay. You need to go on the, uh, go to the slideshow, please. Yeah, good. Okay, okay. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for everyone uh, being here virtually to uh, listen to my talk. It's a summary of my PhD research on phosphorus chemistry and extraterrestrial ices. And so I'll begin here with the inspiration for this, which were the discovery of alkyl phosphonic acids on the Murchison meteorites, specifically the methyl ethyl, propyl, and butyl phosphonic acids. And the reason that this, uh, you know, stirred our curiosity or in our interest is because back in 1955, Addison Gulick first proposed that the phosphorus that is normally found on Earth, which is a phosphase, a plus five oxidation state, such as the mineral appetite here, is not particularly soluble. And so he wondered how did the first life on Earth incorporate this phosphorus, given that it wasn't particularly soluble. And so he proposed that maybe there was some other form of phosphorus, such as phosphorus with a plus one or plus three oxidation state, such as in phosphonic acid and phosphonic acid. And maybe these were available for the first life on Earth in order to bioaccumulate phosphorus. And so if you were to consider that plus three oxidation state of phosphonic acid, that's what the methyl phosphonic acid has here. In addition, methyl phosphonic acid also has an organic group to it. And so there is a astrobiological implications to these molecules here. And so that's where we kind of started is, okay, let's see if we could form methyl phosphonic acid in an extraterrestrial environment to try to figure out how could it have become incorporated into the Murchison meteorite. And so a list of the interstellar molecules that contained phosphorus here begins a starting point in choosing where could that phosphorus have come from. And so my goal was to, to make um, ice analogs, so interstellar ice analogs, choosing compounds that had elements in methyl phosphonic acid, for example. These are my choices that I, for phosphorus chose phosphine in this one for two reasons. It is perhaps one of the more simpler ones in that it does not contain any other heavy atom other than phosphorus, as well as even though all of these you could probably say are unstable, phosphine is the most stable of them and we could work with it as a reactant. Phosphine has been found in many environments extraterrestrially. It's found in the circumstellar envelope of IRC plus 10216. It's found in the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn. And, and even though so far it's not been found in ices of molecular clouds, we're gonna make the assumption that it is here and then be able to react in those ices. And so a basic experimental objective is to take phosphine, that's their source of phosphorus. For oxygen, I chose water. And then for the, the organic carbon group, I chose methane. Simple molecules, water and phosphine, both known to exist in interstellar ices, and create model ices of these, which will simulate to see if I could form methyl phosphonic acid. But it's maybe important to note though, that even though methyl phosphonic acid, because of going back to you know, reduce oxidation states and bioavailability is one of the goals, phosphorus in biomolecules exists as a plus five oxidation state with a phosphorus surrounded by four oxygen atoms and then a linkage between the phosphorus, oxygen, and carbon atoms found in most biomolecules. And so not only is methyl phosphonic acid a good goal to find, but methyl phosphoric acid would also be interesting to find because that is in many ways a, a, a simple analog of a biomolecule containing the moiety of a phosphorus atom, an oxygen atom, and a carbon atom in the plus five oxidation state. Now, previously I had done experiments with just phosphine, phosphine and methane and phosphine and water. And I'd found a variety of different uh, compounds. For example, here with phosphine and water found various different phosphorus oxo acids, everything from one oxygen atom up to four oxygen atoms with phosphoric acid, as well as a diphosphoric acid with two phosphorus atoms. And so the basic building blocks I found was here, but then the addition of methane I was wondering, can then the methyl phosphonic acid be formed? These experiments were conducted at the Keck Laboratory at the University of Hawaii, shown in the picture here. As a schematic of this, uh, the experiments were conducted here in the center uh, on a, a, um, a cold finger down to five Kelvin. 
The analytical tools available include infrared spectroscopy, as well as quadruple mass spectrometry, as well as reflectron time of flight mass spectrometry. These, um, using this RTOF uh, mass spectrometer, this was, these molecules were ionized as they sublimed using pulse vacuum ultraviolet photoionization, uh, which I'll be describing to you in a minute. The ices were processed using 5 keV electrons. And the basic experiment started by depositing an ice. These ices were about 750 nan nanometers thick. This was chosen so that the electrons um, that were radiating them did not hit the silver substrate behind them. They were deposited at 5 Kelvin at ultra high vacuum pressures. And for one hour, they were radiated with 5 keV electrons. Afterwards, then temperature programmed of desorption occurred 1 Kelvin a minute from 5 Kelvin up to either 300 or 320 Kelvin. This is one of the first um, techniques that could be used to identify molecules as many of many of these molecules have unique sublimation temperatures as seen here with the various phosphanes from P1 to P8 phosphanes with increasing sublimation temperatures with increasing mass. So going back to the analytical techniques, infrared spectroscopy, um, it's shown an example spectrum here, um, only had limited utility for us, mainly in that it did not detect the, the small molecules uh, that we were interested in. It did detect functional groups. And so, for example, I would be able to detect a phosphorus bonded, double bonded to an oxygen or single bonded to an oxygen. However, molecules such as methylphosphonic acid, methylphosphoric acid, and many of the isomers of these all have similar functional groups and could not be uniquely identified with infrared spectroscopy. And so mass spectrometry was much more useful. Comparing quadrupole mass spectrometry versus time flight mass spectrometry uh, of the same compound here, this is a, a temperature program desorption spectrum of mass 35, which is a protonated phosphine. You can see that the time of flight mass spectrometer is much more sensitive. And so this will, uh, this will be the mass spectrometer that I will focus on. An example of how the, the data would look then, for example, this is an integrated time of flight count. So it just shows the masses from here to 40 to 100 um, for three different experiments. Um, it shows two different ways that we uh, work to identify the molecules of interest. First of all, we use different isotopes. And so the different colors here with red showing are non-isotopically labeled phosphine water methane ice the oxygen uh, 18 labeled ice in green, and then a carbon 13 labeled ice in blue, you can see that there are shifts in the masses between the experiments. Um, and, and so this is one way that we can help identify to determine what ices were formed. But then we also have different ionization energies. In the corner there, it says 10.49 EV and 9.93 EV. And if you were to look closely, there are some peaks that occur at 10.49 EV that do not occur at 9.93 EV because these molecules um, can be ionized at 10.49, but not 9.93. There's a lot of different molecules here, but let's look at specific ones of interest. Here are various potential products showing one phosphorus atom, one carbon atom, and different numbers of oxygen atoms ranging from one oxygen, from two, three, and four oxygen atoms. Their ionization energies are shown here, and we're going to use those ionization energies to specifically determine which of the isomers are present. I've highlighted here methylphosphonic acid with 10.35 EV. And the way that we generate those is by using uh, two lasers. And I'm going to show an example here of how to make 10.86 EV as a kind of a hypothetical example of how our lasers work. We have two YAG lasers, uh, which pump two dye lasers. Eventually, we're going to overlap these in, in our chamber to create a vacuum ultraviolet photon using four-wave mixing from the equation down here, two omega-1 minus omega-2. For omega-1, we generated that using um, this first YAG laser here, which pumped a dye laser to produce 606 nanometers. After tripling, it became 202 nanometers. On the, and that was used for omega-1. Omega-2 then uses the second YAG laser to pump a dye laser, in this case producing 890 nanometers as omega-2. They are overlapped, sent into the chamber, um, which then through a pulse valve with either krypton or xenon, and it, 
this is this nonlinear medium then um, where the forward mixing can occur. These photons can then generate inside the vacuum chamber a vacuum ultraviolet photon that we can tune using different dyes here. With that in mind, with my experiments, we used three different photoionization energies. The highest one was 10.49. That can ionize all the molecules here. Taking it a step down to 10.35, that can ionize both the ones that are highlighted in green and blue, and then 9.93 would just ionize those that are highlighted in blue. And therefore, for methyl phosphonic acid here, these could be used to specifically ionize um, methyl phosphonic acid and nothing else, or to use the determinant. And so these two TPD profiles here, on the left showing the isomers with three oxygen atoms, and on the right with four oxygen atoms, at different isotopes with non-isotopically labeled oxygen 18 and carbon 13. These are how I will determine how, um, which molecules I can form given that there are different ionization energies that are used. First, let's start on the right, in particular because looking at oxygen 18, there is no signal. And therefore, even though there's a signal here at 112 and 113, these are related to some other isomers or some other compounds even, and therefore methyl phosphoric acid does not sublime from the ice and thus was not detected with the reflectron, uh, time of flight match spectrometer. So could not detect those methyl phosphoric acid. So I'm gonna eliminate those and let's focus on the left side. Here we see three different bands, sublimation bands uh, that are here. And the green one is an important one. So even though the 96 peak is fairly strong, there is actually several different molecular formulas that could contribute to form this one. And so the oxygen 18 was especially useful here because it was unique to methyl phosphonic acid. And here, uh, using the, the green band that's shown here, this sublimation event, it shows that there was a peak at 10.49 EV as well as 10.35 EV, but there was no signal at 9.3 EV. And so that means that with no signal at 9.93 EV, the lowest ionization energy ones were eliminated. There still was one at 10.35. And so that confirmed for us methyl phosphonic acid. Now you'll notice though that during this uh, TPD, the signal continues past 300 Kelvin and you know, to 320 Kelvin or so. And so that indicates that this compound may not be especially uh, volatile at these, at these temperatures. It might, may not be subliming completely. And so when I removed the silver wafer, there was a residue that was left behind. And we had this sent off for analysis in which these residues were solvated and then a GC analysis um, was used to identify separate compounds and identify them with mass spectrometry. And it, as you see from the results here, actually there were many compounds of interest in these residues, in particular, uh, methyl phosphonic acid, ethyl propyl, uh, and methyl phosphoric acid. So the compounds I'm interested in were all here uh, in these residues. As far as yields um, from the, the residues, most of the residue was uh, a phosphoric acid, uh, is over here in nanomoles, 78 moles. The next highest one was methyl phosphonic acid, about three nanomoles, and then the other ones are much less than this. As a comparison of how much, how much of these yields compared to how much phosphine actually reacted, this is one area where infrared spectroscopy is useful, is seeing the reduction in signal. And given the reduction signal here, uh, we calculated about 180 nanomoles would have reacted of phosphine. And so of 180 nanomoles that reacted, approximately half of them ended up in the residue. The other half would have sublime and thus be detected by our uh, reflectron time of flight mass spectrometer. And so sort of a, a summary of this, there are many different compounds that can be formed with water, phosphine, and methane through many different reaction mechanisms um, through a big scheme. And there are many different products that can be formed. And so each of these are products throughout my PhD that I was able to detect. The one I presented today though of a particular importance for my dissertation was methyl phosphonic acid and methyl phosphoric acid. Methyl, methyl phosphonic acid because it was detected in the mergers and meteorite, um, has biological implications as a soluble form of phosphorus that would have been available for the first life on earth. Also methyl phosphoric acid I discovered in these ices and so these already have the 
the chemical connectivity uh, that is seen in modern biomolecules, phosphorus, oxygen, carbon moiety. And so with that, I'd like to thank um, these funding agencies and individuals who've helped me with my research. And thank you for listening. I'm ready for questions. Okay, um, do we have any questions? Um, if anyone has any questions, please uh, put the question down in the chat box, please. Um, um, so we do have a question. Do you think pH3 can be formed in ISIS as well from um, NEELS? Um, so there, there is increasing research about that. Um, and I, I guess I don't want to be the authority on whether or not they can be formed in the ice. And so there's, there's of course, two ways to, to think about this, whether or not the ice was formed um, in the gas phase and then um, deposited on the ice, or was the form of phosphorus. And I know that there is research that I've read recently about phosphorus in the ices um, that have become hydrogenated and form phosphine. So do I believe that there's phosphine in the ices? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Martin Baer. Uh, could you couple the setup to uh, MS with high resolution like an orbit trap? Would this help in the assignment? You know, if we could get, um, you know, say high resolution max, you know, a way, if we could get high resolution mass spectrometry, it would help. Um, I don't think that, you know, it's necessarily needed, you know, from what we have. I, I think that a, a much more useful um, you know, for us to identify molecules, if we had a much, you know, better way to ionize them, you know, much more easily, for example, using um, like a synchrotron, for example, that we had uh, all the ionization interviews available. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess I would say anything that would help us improve, you know, the, the ability to detect these molecules could help. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other question at the moment. Um, if you have any more questions, you can still type it in in the chat box. Otherwise, you can, um, of course, contact Andrew if you have other pressing issues or questions. Or you could uh, write to uh, any of us and we will be happy to connect you with, uh, with Andrew for questions, other, further discussions. So um, thank you for, thank you, Andrew, for. Uh, very nice talk. I'm going to clap. I know a lot of people are clapping, although you can't hear because they're all muted. But thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so there is a virtual clap that I can see some people are uh, doing. So thank you very much. You can, um, I'm going to uh, go ahead. We're right on time, actually, at 11.25. Uh, yeah, now we're going to switch to uh, switch to our second talk of this morning, and that's going to be given by Professor Alexander Chielens. So I'm going to um, <clears throat> hand it over to Zander now. And Zander, you can start sharing your screen. There you go, we, we got you and Perfect. Uh, I'm sure it's coming up in a second. Yeah, we, we can see your screen, but um, it's not full screen yet. We see some kind of an edit version. Yeah, it looks strange, huh? Let me see. Uh, this this should still work. Uh, if you can uh, take that arrow, hit that arrow on the right and make that sidebar disappear, that will uh, that'll make the screen. Can you, can you see this better? Um, I don't see any change yet, but I'm going to wait for a second. Oh, yes. Your screen sharing is paused, it says here. Uh, um, that's, uh, is that right? Uh, we'll have to figure that out. Uh, but I think 
I think we can see. Can you can you try and uh, see if you can go forward or backward in, in your screen and see if that uh, changes anything? Full screen mode. Is it full screen in your um, in your screen, Sandra? Yeah, it is full screen on my screen. Yeah. Okay, that's kind of strange. We don't see it full screen. Um, you see it change? Not yet. Um, is anyone else seeing any change? Kyle, Heather, can you? No, no I'm seeing the PDF window. Um, I, I would suggest uh, if you can go out of your um, out of your uh, full screen mode once and. Uh, stop share and start share again. Uh, one more time, just one more time. Yeah, and and if you can hide that sidebar before you uh, go to the yeah, just click yeah. Okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, uh, we'll do it this way. Yeah, uh, and if. Um, you can try one more time to see if, if you can get go to that full screen mode and if it'll work or not. I don't know. Uh, no change yet. Okay, it's a. Uh, the screen like doesn't it. seem to work. We can, we can see. It. Yeah, we can. We can see. Let's it. let's do it this way and let's not uh, spend more time on this. Yeah, it, it's a pleasure to talk about uh, the molecular universe. It's uh, it has been a. Uh, a, a mainstay of my research for the last uh, 30, 40 years. Um, and it has been fascinating these, these 30, 40 years, as we have made many, many progresses uh, uh, over the years. And I think we are living in a very special kind of time. We're living in a time when our view of the universe is changing very, very rapidly. And it's particularly true when you think about um, the, the presence of uh, planets in the universe. When I started uh, in research as a graduate student, there were uh, eight, nine planets known, uh, uh, um, but none outside of the solar system. And now, of course, uh, planets are, are galore. Uh, every star uh, in the Milky Way uh, will have a planetary system. Uh, and and uh, of every five G stars in the Milky Way, there is one with a uh, with a terrestrial planet in the habitable zone, and so there's a very different view uh, of uh, uh, of the universe than we had before. And in fact, it's like the last step in the Copernican revolution, taking the Earth out of the center of the universe. At the same time, we have discovered that life really occupies all niches on the Earth, whether that be the grand prismatic pool in the Yellowstone National Park, in the very hot water there, we find life. In very cold environments, in the lakes under the Antarctic ice crusts, we find life. In the driest spots on Earth, the Atacama Desert, when you dig deep enough, you find these little salt crystals, and on top of those salt crystals, there are these little bacteria that are living from the collected water. And then we find them life in, the, in acidic places in the depths of the ocean. So life really occupies all niches on Earth, where life can be, life is. And the last thing that I want to highlight is that life started really almost immediately in, uh, uh, when, when the conditions were there. Uh, was into, uh, if, if you look at the, um, uh, if you look at the records, uh, then, then you find that uh, within 200 million years uh, of the late heavy bombardment, we find the first signatures of, uh, of life, first fossils of life. And it may have been present even before, it may have been present actually even before the last, uh, if, uh, before the late Harvey bombardment. And so that has changed our thinking about, uh, about uh, the, uh, the universe. It has led to this new paradigm that life undoubtedly is widespread in the universe. And for anybody who grew up in the uh, 70s or 80s and remembers the Star Wars movies, uh, it's, it's very obvious that that's uh, a very believable uh, suggestion. And it has given rise to uh, the field of astrobiology, 
field of study of life uh, in, the, in the universe. And astrochemistry, astrochemistry is what put astro in astrobiology. Astrochemistry is, going to, is linking the um, uh, diversity of molecules in the uh, interstellar medium, in the regions of planets and star formation, in the, uh, uh, on the nascent Earth. Uh, and uh, what the, one of the key questions in molecular astrophysics and astrochemistry is, is what is this organic inventory uh, in regions of star and planet formation? How is that related to uh, what was present on the Earth and the uh, other terrestrial planets in the solar system. Astrochemistry also studies other aspects. Uh, what is the role of interstellar molecules in the evolution of the universe? Uh, did they play an active role? Or were they just um, uh, on viewers, um, uh, watching what happened in the universe? So the, and, and, and the last thing for astronomers is also uh, of interest is, can we use molecules to probe the universe around us? And so those are the three main uh, topics of molecular astrophysics. In this talk, I will focus on this first part, on what is the organic inventory that's available to new planets when they are uh, just formed. And uh, again, when I started uh, 40 years ago, um, uh, there was really one way in which uh, um, uh, molecules were formed. It was formed from small to big. You started with atoms in dark, protected environments of dense clouds. They uh, formed uh, small molecules which grew one atom at a time or two atoms at a time to larger molecules. Those then got connected uh, into, deposited into comets and asteroids which transported them to the Earth. That was sort of the uh, general idea. Now, in recent times, we have discovered that there is another way of making molecules uh, in the universe. And that's when you start from big to small. All old stars, stars like the sun, when they become old, they inject much of their material back into the interstellar medium. And much of that is in the form of large molecules, in the form of soot particles. And, and that's basically the same way um, the uh, um, shooting flames do that. If you were here, uh, I'm in California at the moment, if you were here, you looked outside of the window uh, to the sky in the Bay Area, you could see the soot uh, and the, uh, from the flames and the fires in, uh, in Washington and Oregon driving over, giving an eerie orange glow. And, and, and that's basically the pollution from those fires. That's the same way in how the universe is being polluted by stars in the late stages of their uh, evolution. When they inject that material into the interstellar medium, then they, that can be processed uh, to uh, smaller molecules, basically breaking it down from big to small. Those can all be collected again in comets and asteroids and deposited uh, on the Earth. And so there are two ways of making molecules and delivering that uh, to the Earth. One is from small to big, the other is from big to small. And when you think about the chemistry that's taking place, there are a lot of processes that are, that are uh, playing a role. Uh, ion molecule reactions, cosmic wave photolysis, um, uh, ice uh, hydrogenation and, uh, and the processing by energetic particles, as we heard in the, in the first talk today, and uh, evaporation and further ch uh, chemistry in the hot phases uh, of the uh, solar nebula or protosolar protoplanetary disks. And in the terms of the power reservoir, the, the large molecules breaking down to small ones, it's of course soot chemistry and shock chemistry that plays a role. Again, uh, processing by UV and X-rays, uh, radical reactions that can play a role. And uh, all of this uh, can be of, uh, of great importance. So it's a very diverse set of reactions that plays a role and that way it will lead to a very diverse uh, inventory uh, of species present in the interstellar medium, present in regions of star and planet formation. Now, in this talk, I will try to highlight some of these things and draw some uh, more general conclusion uh, based on three topics that are of interest to me that have been uh, with me for uh, a couple uh, of those decades that I have been in the field. One is infrared spectroscopy of PEHs. The other is the photochemistry of the PEHs and how you can form fullerenes from that. And the last part is the molecular carriers of the diffuse interstellar bands. 
Let me start with the first one that um, started um, in the early 80s, the 70s and the 80s, when we discovered that there were these bright infrared emission features uh, that were present everywhere that we looked with our telescopes. And these are two spectra from about uh, 2 to 20 microns, showing the broad uh, features here uh, indicated by these red uh, areas uh, at 3, 3, 6, 2, 7, 7, 8, 6, 11, 2, and 12.7. And these are uh, due to simple modes in uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon materials. And once you know this, once you know where these modes are, you can take a filter and with the filter you can collect, uh, make photographs in the light of, uh, of a particular band. And you can see what the universe looks like if you look, look at it through molecular eyes. And this is for two examples of that. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the star forming region in Orion. Uh, the central region, which is white here, is the very bright M42 region, which is a ionized gas created by the trapezium stars. But those trapezium stars also send out uh, uh, far ultraviolet photons, and those far ultraviolet photons are illuminating the surroundings. And molecules uh, in the surrounding absorb these photons and then uh, uh, fluoresce in the infrared. And so all the red that you see on this image is due to these uh, uh, fluorescence from these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules. And that's here on a scale of um, uh, uh, 10 uh, light years. Uh, and all illuminated by this one uh, central uh, star. On the, on the left hand side, you see the uh, Whirlpool galaxy M51, you see the central uh, nucleus, and then you see these beautiful spiral arms coming out of them. And if you uh, have a good resolution uh, screen, then you can see some blue dots. And, and each of those blue dots is a region like the, the Orion region on the, uh, on the right. And so you can see that here on the scale of this whole uh, galaxy, on a scale of uh, 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 several thousand uh, light years, the whole galaxy is a glow in the light of these molecules. And so it's clear that these molecules are very uh, uh, present, they're only present, they're everywhere, they must be abundant because they dominate the light uh, at these wavelengths. And uh, they, uh, they, they must be important in the whole uh, organic inventory. And we, when we do the numbers, about 5% of all the carbon uh, is in the form of these, uh, these molecules. Now, this is a, a zooming in to a, a, a newly formed star and planet region. This is the star HD 97048. And we are now looking at a scale size of a, uh, of, a uh, of a solar system. The scale size is uh, a few hundred AU, so it's a few hundred times the uh, size of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. And, and the, the central region where the star is not resolved, but all the color that you see, all this green color in this case, is due to fluorescence from these uh, large uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules. So it's clear that in regions of uh, star and planet formation, these molecules are also very present, are also very abundant, are also very important. And so we like to understand what the composition is of these molecules and uh, what their characteristics are, just to understand the organic inventory of these regions. And uh, over the last 20 years, uh, much effort has been spent by uh, spectroscopists uh, measuring the uh, infrared spectral signatures of different pHs. And most of that was done uh, through uh, quantum chemistry, DFT calculations. About 4,000 species have been calculated now with up to 384 carbon atoms. And uh, these have been validated against meter graduation spectra of small parts. And then when you do that, you discover that you have to make small correction factors to account for issues with the basis set, anomonicity, and other effects. And all of that has been collected into a database. This is the uh, NASA Ames uh, database accessible through this uh, website. And, and, and at this point, of course, the, the question is, how reliable are these results? How good are they? Because in the end, they are validated for a few small parts, but then against matrix isolation spectra, matrix isolation spectra have their own issues and may not be very valid for, for comparison for gas-phase species. 
So the group in Amsterdam under Wieman Jan Boema has uh, done an extensive job on uh, measuring in the gas phase the infrared spectra of a number of small PEHs. Elena Maltzeveria uh, and Sander Lemons have done this. And you see some of the results here. I see show four, uh, uh, four sets of spectra. Uh, the top two are uh, in the 3000 wave number region, so the CH stretch region. The bottom ones are in the uh, 500 to uh, 2000 wave number region, which are the, uh, uh, the CH out of plane and in plane bending modes and the CC uh, stretching modes. In each case, the top trace is a experimental me spectrum measured through line dip uh, uh, method at a uh, very high resolution. Now the bottom trace in each of these panels is the harmonic uh, calculation, the, excuse me, the harmonic calculation scaled with the scaling factor. I can see that it doesn't do, it, it doesn't do too bad a job. It actually, this is fairly uh, reasonable in terms of the peak position of these, uh, of these bands. The middle traces, green in the top uh, two panels and, and in, the bot in, in the bottom uh, two panels, uh, anharmonic uh, spectra, those that uh, uh, take into account, say, the quartic for, uh, force field as well. And uh, no correction factor has been applied. You can see that there is now a very good agreement in both in peak position, in relevant densities, and also in the range of uh, 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 over which absorption uh, occurs in these spectra. Uh, and, and particularly for, say, the 3 microne, the 3000 wave number region, this is um, a, quite an achievement because this region is dominated by resonance effects, interaction between modes, and, and sub small changes in the uh, peak frequencies, small mismatches in peak frequencies, will lead to a very different spectrum. And so uh, this is um, a a beautiful comparison in, in, in my sense. And, uh, but once you have done these anharmonic uh, calculations, you can go a step further and you can uh, 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 look, look even deeper. And this shows the spectrum of naphthalene. Uh, the bottom is an uh, experimental spectrum measured by uh, Olivier Pirali and co-workers in Paris. It's centered on one specific mode uh, of uh, 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 naphthalene. It's, it's only spanning uh, about, uh, uh, what's it, uh, 10 wave numbers in, uh, in, in range. And you see that this mode, this fundamental mode, is accompanied by a number of satellite bands. And, and each of those uh, uh, bands due to uh, this, this fundamental, but then shifted because there is an anharmonic, uh, there is an excitation in, in one of the adjacent modes. And that shifts the band by a, a fixed amount, and you can actually see this progression due to different number of uh, excitations in these, uh, in these uh, separate modes. And you can see a number of those uh, are present, depending on uh, which modes is being interacted with. Up here is the calculation uh, done by uh, Cameron McKee and Alessandra Candian, uh, who calculated the spectrum of naphthalene, uh, that's what the blue traces are, then convolved it with a, uh, with a, uh, a Gaussian. And uh, you can see that the same uh, 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 trend occurs, the same kind of uh, spectral detail is present, and you can see these similar kind of uh, uh, band series. So basically, this anharmonic interaction shifts the absorption from the uh, from the normal frequency to a uh, typically a lower frequency. And, and I should uh, there's a very good comparison, and uh, I should emphasize that there's no free parameter in this uh, in this comparison. That's of course an absorption spectrum, we should, but we are really interested in emission spectra. And uh, of course, when you're talking about an emission spectrum, then you're talking about a molecule that's highly excited. That means that there is uh, absorption in many different uh, adjacent frequencies, ad adjacent modes, and that all bands will shift. Uh, the spectrum of pyrene was measured in emission by Rich Sekely group uh, that's shown here by these black traces in each of these panels uh, in the different wavelength regions. This is the three mic on the CH stretch, this is the CH out of plane bending mode, and this is the CC and the CH in plane bending mode region. And uh, the bottom 
blue trace is what is calculated for zero degrees uh, for absorption spectra. And uh, then when you then use the LMNST, you develop a model for uh, the interaction of these modes and you calculate what then the spectra is uh, uh, once the molecule is excited by a 5 eV photon, uh, photon, which is what was used to get these experimental spectra. And you see that the band shift, it's very clear when you look at the bottom uh, uh, right panel where the CH mode has shifted considerably. Uh, and you see that uh, the calculators actually do a good job in uh, matching these shifts and then matching these uh, uh, the widths of these uh, these features. The see it stretching region looks fairly complicated uh, in these uh, calculations and that's because of these uh, these uh, resonance effects. Uh, and uh, it's not clear how good the comparison is because the uh, experimental uh, spectra uh, have too low resolution to resolve any of the spectral detail that we see uh, in the uh, in the uh, calculations. Now, one of the results of this uh, anamnesty is, of course, that the band uh, shifts, uh, and as the molecule cools down, then it means that uh, it, the shift is smaller and smaller, and uh, this leads to a very characteristic profile where you have a, a peak and then a, a red shaded ring. And this is uh, the right panel is a calculation that shows uh, this ring as a function of internal energy for the tetracene, uh, calculate for the tetracene uh, molecule. You can see that uh, this, the strength of this wing depends very much on the internal excitation. In the left panel, you see three uh, observed astronomical bands, which all show this kind of uh, general behavior of a, a sharp blue rise and a long uh, red uh, tail. And, and this is very characteristic for infrared fluorescence uh, of and in, in cascade from a high energy to a, uh, to a low energy. So in terms of the infrared spectroscopy, where do we stand? Well, the anamonic uh, DFT calculations do well, 0.2% uh, uh, differences. That's, that's a few wave numbers still. And uh, so we, when James Webb uh, comes around, then uh, we may need some better uh, models even, which would require even higher order terms and resonances uh, to be taken into account. At the present, this is limited to relatively small species, uh, 30 atoms or less, basically because of computer limitations. But Moore's law is on our side, and in the end, we hope that uh, in silico calculations, we'll be able to get very accurate uh, spectra for us. And let me also say that harmonic DFT does well in terms of peak position uh, uh, if we include these multiple scaling factors. In terms of the emission, uh, the ammonic, anamonic models compare well with the pyrene experiments, gives much confidence in our understanding of the uh, emission uh, process, and the anamonic models also compare qualitatively relatively well with the observed line profiles that we see uh, in interstellar spectra. So let's now shift gear and look at the photochemistry of um, PHs and the formation of fullerenes. And this, of course, uh, it was initiated by this study by Jan Camille of the Planetary Nebula TC1, where he found a, a spectrum. This is a spectrum from about 5 to 25 microns. Uh, uh, that is very different from the spectrum that we see normally in the interstellar media. This spectrum is very different from the past spectrum uh, uh, that I've shown you before. Uh, it's a very unique spectrum and it shows bands that are clearly identifiable as the bands due to C60, the fluorine, uh, uh, the buckyball uh, molecule. And uh, in this source, the uh, collection of molecules that's available is dominated clearly by, uh, by these, uh, these fluorines. And, and uh, once we recognized what the signature of these bands is, particularly these two bands here at uh, 17 and 18.9 microns, we started to look for them in our other spectra and we did find them as well. Uh, uh, this is the region NGC 7023, there's a central star here in the blue, uh, it has created this cavity and uh, it's illuminating the walls of this cavity. 
and the walls of this cavity are glowing in the infrared. And when in this area here, indicated by the CM box, we have taken spectra, and we have a full spectral map. And when you look at those maps, you typically see this PEH spectra, but uh, when you get uh, in some areas, you also start to see these C60 bands. And once you know this, you can uh, you play a little game, you can just measure the strength of those bands and then they uh, give those a color coding, blue for C60, uh, green for the PEHs and red for the background. And then uh, you get this uh, top uh, right panel, which shows the distribution of these different compounds in the uh, environment of this star where you should realize that the star is somewhere here in the, the, the bottom uh, left uh, corner of the top uh, right panel. And you can see that uh, when you get close to the star, the abundance of these uh, C60 increases very much, while actually the abundance of the PEHs decreases. And so that raises the question, well, what happens when you expose PEHs to a strong ultraviolet re uh, uh, radiation? And this is a, a schematic uh, illustration of what we think uh, is happening. You start off with PEHs in the top uh, right uh, uh, corner of this diagram. Uh, when you shine UV light on it, the PEHs will start to lose halogen. Uh, that's the weakest link that will go first. You will form graphene sheets, you will form a, a, a carbon clusters, and then once you have lost all the hydrogen, you can start to lose carbon atoms, and then you'll go to uh, flats, uh, rings, and then chains. But while you have this fragmentation going on, you can also have isomerization, and the, the, the species, particularly graphene uh, species, can isomerize to cages and even to fullerene. And so this is what we think is the, uh, the, the two chemical processes that are initiated by interaction with UV photons. It's on the one hand dehydrogenation and fragmentation, and on the other hand it's this isomerization. And so Jung Feng uh, uh, Zen uh, has studied uh, the uh, uh, photolysis of PEHs in an ion trap shining on it with strong uh, ultraviolet lasers. And, and this is for the hexabenzocoronine uh, PEH. And you can see what is happening. You start off with hexabenzocoronine, you strip off all the halogen one by one until you're left with the carbon cluster. And then uh, in the bottom trace, you can see that uh, you start losing two carbon atoms at a time, forming these, uh, these clusters. Until you reach the C32, and at that point, uh, you actually fragment the whole molecule, and you're left with carbon chains uh, and rings uh, at, at a small end. And uh, then, then we can compare the, the photolysis of PHs and C60 and, and the fullerenes. The top panel here shows C60 itself exposed to a, a, a 355 nanometer laser. And you can start to see that you start to break it down. Again, two carbon atoms at a time. And uh, you can also see that there are some magic numbers. Uh, some of these clusters are more stable than their neighbors, and it's particularly clear here. And, and uh, when you take C70, you see the same uh, trend. So you start with C70, and when you shine on it with the laser, you start to lose two carbon atoms at a time. You see that C60 is a very particular uh, magic number. It's really very stable uh, molecule. It's fairly highly abundant, but you break it down to smaller and smaller. Same happens for these two paths, C60H22 and C66H26. You first trip up all the halogens, then you have your carbon clusters, you break them down, and you again see these magic numbers appear. And so that already indicates that uh, likely you have similar kind of uh, destruction pathway. This is done in a very uh, a slightly different wavelength, it's 532 nanometers. And, and we did this because C60 doesn't absorb at 532. That means that C60 is just uh, happily sitting there in our ion trap, even on the irradiation of 120 millijoule. If you take C70, which is the bottom trace, and you can see that C70 does absorb. It is broken down uh, until you reach C60. Uh, it breaks down two carbon atoms at a time. The cage shrinks until you reach C60, and C60 doesn't absorb. And so everything below that is, uh, you don't form any fragments below that. 
Now, when you look at the C60 H22 uh, pH, you can see you strip off all the hardigans and you start to form these, uh, these uh, carbon clusters as well. You see some indication of the magic numbers, but C60 itself is not very magic in this one. But if you do start with C66 H26, you lose all your uh, hydrogens, and now you do see that uh, C60 is, is a, a magic number, it is highly present. And so we think that if you start with the pH which is larger than, than 60 carbon atoms, you can strip off all the hydrogens, uh, and then once you have done that, you can start the isomerization process, and you do have enough uh, time to go to, a, uh, to the buckyball. And we look at the numbers, you can see that some of it's still destroyed. And, and the um, branching ratio we think is of the order of 25% uh, going to C60 to the buckyball. And so we sort of in the summary, uh, we see that C60 is present in its cellar spectra, with abundance which is about 1% of the pHs. A power photochemistry is this competition, there's fragmentation taking place, but there's also isomerization. Fragmentation starts with loss of hydrogen and carbon cluster formation, and the carbon clusters uh, can evolve, and some of that evolution can lead to, uh, to uh, fullerenes. Now let's now turn to the last uh, topic, that's the diffuse interstellar bands. The fused interstellar bands were actually discovered almost 100 years ago, uh, and uh, they are a set of about, uh, by now, about 400 uh, bands that are known, and they're sort of schematically shown here in this uh, colorful uh, uh, representation. Uh, absorption going down, and the color indicates sort of the wavelengths that uh, we're looking at. They are diffuse, that means that they're broader than a typical atomic line. They have typically a width of a, a, a one, two wave numbers. And we see them in many, many different places. All diffuse, uh, diffuse places in the interstellar medium. Not so much in molecular clouds or superstellar shells. Now, uh, we think that these, these bands are all due to molecular carriers. And one of the reasons why we think that is, if you look at the top uh, right panel, you see uh, one of those bands breaks up at high resolution in the uh, characteristic P, Q, and R branch uh, structure of a, uh, of a molecule. Uh, and so we see this substructure. We also see variations in the relative strengths of these uh, features that's illustrated in the top uh, left panel where the, both the traces are for two different stars. They are normalized in such a way that the band at 5797 uh, has equal strengths. And you can see that the other band is very different in strengths in these two spectra. So the, 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 the bands do, do show variations relative to each other. And I would like to draw your attention to the bottom uh, panel where you see again this schematic spectrum of the, uh, uh, of the diffuse interstellar bands. I want to draw your attention that there are a couple of bands that are much stronger than all the others. Then there are some bands which are, uh, you know, a fraction of that. And there are lots and lots and lots of weak bands. And think, uh, if we want to identify these, uh, these uh, carriers, the molecular carriers of these features, I think we should focus on the strong bands. Uh, those, those are the best um, uh, indicators of something that's unique that we can identify. I think that if you go down into the noise, you will, uh, you go deep enough, you will dig deep enough, you'll find an absorption at every frequency. And then, of course, it becomes very difficult to identify anything. When we look at the spectra, we also see excitation variations. Typically, the bands are very narrow, but on a few side lines, the bands broaden. This is the uh, nine Sagittarius. The red trace is a typical interstellar medium sideline. Most bands, most sidelines look like this. The black one is Herschel 36. There we're looking through a very dense, very highly illuminated uh, region, lots of UV photons around, and uh, the bands are much broader. And this is just an effect of uh, a rotational excitation uh, in these bands uh, of, of the carrier. And when we work out the numbers, then uh, this kind of a band, a typical band is of uh, one and a half wave numbers, means that the rotational temperature is about 100 degrees. While the band uh, carrier in the, in the uh, Herschel 36 environment is probably like 300 degrees. Now, the rotational temperature is set by electronic excitation and then followed by infrared decay. And every time you uh, emit a photon, you, of course, you can have a, a rotational delta J, transition delta J uh, plus or minus one or zero. 
And then when you work out what the numbers are, you find that rotational temperature is basically set by, a, a, by the vibrational energy of the typical uh, modes divided by 6K. And for typical numbers for a PEH, that is about 100 degrees. And so for a large PEH, uh, these things uh, work out well. So where, uh, why do I bring this up? Well, one of the reasons uh, is, is, of course, that in recent years we have identified uh, uh, two of those diffuse intercellular bands with the C60 molecule, uh, C60 plus molecule. Uh, and that was a story that started in the mid 90s when uh, John Meyer uh, measured uh, the spectrum of C60 plus in the uh, in neon matrix and uh, astronomers went out, uh, uh, Ben Affoy and Pascal Urfoyd went out, measured uh, in this very difficult uh, wavelength region, they uh, measured the spectra of the dips and came up with two clear uh, near coincidences. It took uh, John Meyer 20 years to perfect his, uh, his experimental technique to be able to measure these uh, spectra, not in a neon matrix, but in the gas phase, using the Dieter Gerlich's uh, 22 pole uh, trap. And uh, 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 the comparison is, uh, is very good. This shows the, the comparison for these two, uh, two strong bands. In the meantime, three weaker bands have also been identified uh, and attributed to C60+. Plus. And I want to emphasize that it's a very difficult wavelength region to, uh, to work in because of the lure correction. So a lot of OH uh, air glow lines that uh, have to be taken into account. And, and in fact, one of the most recent uh, steps forward was when an HST took a spectrum confirming uh, these uh, these. Uh, 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 these uh, spectral characteristics. The other aspect that uh, is not always appreciated enough is that uh, the photosphere of these stars has a magnesium two line uh, uh, around these wavelengths and you have to do a very good job in correcting for that and it has not always been done uh, correctly. So where does that leave us? Well this sort of summarizes where we stand. This shows the abundance as a function of the size of the molecule. And I drew this, uh, this blue uh, box, this blue box outline, where I think that the dip carriers uh, sort of live. And uh, the, look, look at these three uh, data points labeled 440, 30, 6284, and 5780. Those are three uh, of the well-known strong bands. And if you take a reasonable uh, uh, oscillator strength, then these are the kind of abundances that you need in order to explain this. Abundances of 10, or of 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 8 with respect to hydrogen. That's a very abundant, so very abundant uh, species. Your weaker dips are um, a, a much uh, lower down. So the, the top of this box is indicated by the uh, the, the strengths of the, the strongest bands, the bonus that you need to explain the strongest band, while the bottom here is, uh, is the way I explain the, 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 the very, very weak bands. And you're talking then about abundances of the order of 10 to the minus 12. Now, I drew here the left side of this box uh, around 30 uh, carbon atoms because basically uh, I think that smaller species are not uh, stable enough to survive the rigors of the interstellar media, the fuse interstellar media. Uh, the, uh, the, the right hand side of this box is because if you make the molecules too big then you need to use too much of the carbon, more of the carbon than you have available. And so this is sort of the area where I think that the, the uh, carriers of the diffuse interstellar bands uh, live. Now, on the a, a right hand, uh, left hand side of this uh, diagram, I show some typical abu measured abundances for small hydrocarbons measured in a, a dark cloud core. So it's a very shielded environment. You can see that for small species, you can get abundances that are sort of in the range of the strongest uh, diffuse interstellar bands. But that's in the very shielded environment. If you go to the diffuse intercellular medium, then those abundances are down by an order of magnitude. And really, you don't see anything larger than uh, three uh, carbon atoms. Uh, uh, C3H uh, is, the, is the biggest one that we actually see. And, and so it's very clear that these small ones are just not very stable because there's so much UV around. And it's very difficult to build anything up 
when you start off and do that one atom at a time. You can see, yeah, it's, it's very clear when you look at this trend, uh, the larger you get, the more, the lower the abundance is. And that's basically that uh, bottom up approach is not very conducive to making big molecules. Now there's another aspect that I want to uh, highlight here. Uh, that is that uh, if you say, hey, maybe the PAS are the, uh, the carriers of these diffuse interstellar bands. Well, if you take the total abundance of PAS, the 5% of the carbon that's locked up in PAS, and say there are maybe 10 PAS that are uh, very abundant, that take up most of those, uh, of, uh, of the abundances of the uh, PAS, let's call them the grand PAS, because they rule the, uh, the, the roosts of the uh, PA family, uh, and, and then you get an abundance which is up here, which is sort of comparable to what you need for the 40 plus 30. If you say that the PA family consists of about 100 uh, members, then uh, the typical abundance is about here, and you uh, can explain, uh, still explain the, the, uh, the, the, the strong, uh, strong bands. But there's a, there's a the side, the flip side to this, uh, to this coin. It means that whatever is, whatever the carriers are of these strong bands, they must be absorbing well in the visible. They must also be absorbing well in the UV because the chromophores, the main chromophores of any molecule are in the far UV. And so they must be absorbing a lot of energy comparable to say a fraction of the, the, the pHs. And, and so they must lose that energy one way or another. They can't lose it by fragmentation because then they wouldn't be abundant enough. So they have to lose it through fluorescence. So that means that if we want to identify the, uh, the uh, carriers of the diffuse and cell bands, we might as well start looking among the, uh, in the infrared spectra and look for things which are at the 10% level uh, or the 5% level in, uh, in terms of energy. And C60 plus is of course a key uh, cornerstone of this argument. Uh, we see the signature of C60 plus at about that level, and so that we see both in the infrared and the uh, uh, and the uh, visible spectra is sort of a uh, good indicator that this may be a winning uh, strategy for identifying the carriers of diffuse interstellar bands. So, in terms of the the, the dip carriers, they run the they have to be very abundant, they have to be very stable, they have to have large oscillator strengths. We do see these variations in rotation, vibration, excitation, which tells us something about the environment they are in. Uh, there is one point that is not always fully appreciated by astronomers, that uh, the bands may vary uh, in relative strengths uh, from one line, side line to the other, even if they come from the same molecule, and that has to do with war vibrational coupling, it may be because there are infrared dark states that are populated and then and the, the strength then depends on these uh, excitations. The main uh, message I want to give is that the signature uh, of the carrier should be visible in the infrared uh, emission spectra and, and we should look at these grandpas of their children and they, they are formed through the top-down uh, chemistry. So I've talked about three different aspects of molecular astrophysics, astrochemistry that, uh, that uh, I'm interested in. And uh, I think it also illustrates very well that if we want to make progress in molecular astrophysics, if astronomers want to understand the molecular inventory of space, then uh, they have to work together with, uh, with uh, physical chemists, with uh, molecular physicists, with spectroscopists, and we all have to work together in a, uh, in a uh, col deep collaboration in order to uh, understand uh, the uh, uh, molecular inventory of, uh, of space. And for uh, the students, uh, let me uh, give the students' perspective here as well. Uh, we, we have these uh, space missions, they cost $1 billion or $10 billion and counting. And the scientific success of all these missions depends really on the work that these graduate students are doing the lab, measuring those, uh, uh, those molecular parameters that we really need in order to transfer those, those very precise measurements that astronomers do into an accurate understanding of what's going on in the interstellar medium. And uh, 
flip side of this is that uh, I like to tell my own graduate students, but graduate students everywhere, that any laboratory study that you do is relevant somewhere in the universe. The molecule that you observe may be present in, the, in some asteroidal environment, may be present in the cell space in, the, in an environment. The process that you're studying may be very relevant somewhere in the universe. And uh, your challenge, of course, uh, for your PhD is to find out where. And before you despair, uh, let me then uh, remind you that I gave you the uh, secret to success in this, that the way to succeed in that is by talking to your uh, local astronomer. And with that, let me give the floor back uh, for questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Xander, for a wonderful talk. This is, this is great. Um, I'm of course, hearing a lot of virtual uh, claps here. Um, I have a bunch of questions. I'm going to uh, pick them one by one. Um, the first one was, uh, uh, are there any bottom-up processes for buckyball formation? And this also, I have a question about that, that can you comment um, a little bit about top-down versus bottom-up formation of buckyballs specifically, but of course, large pHs in general. So we have a bunch of questions here. Yeah, the, the, the problem is a bottom-up is that you need high pressures to do it. You cannot do it in the low pressure environment of the interstellar medium because uh, there are so many processes that can lead to destruction. And that's, if you look, go back to this, uh, to this abundance uh, plot, you can see that the abundance drops very rapidly with uh, increasing chain size because you can only add one carbon atom or two carbon atoms at a time. And uh, you have a limited feedstock and it just, you don't get very big. If you increase the pressure, if you go to the immediate environment of a, of a star that's losing mass, you have much higher pressures. And then uh, on the time scale of, um, of, of the process, which in, in those environments would be maybe a year, maybe a couple of years, uh, you can have enough collisions, you can have enough kinetics going on to form something. And, uh, Okay, um, next question, are there, um, what about planarity? Uh, so as most PHs, uh, most experimental studies on PHs focuses on planar pH, can non-planar pH be considered as potential candidates? Uh, potential candidates for the infrared spectra are, are dominated by, uh, by uh, Cyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And um, yeah, you could uh, imagine clusters of those, you could imagine that they are sort of um, stuck together uh, in, in, in different ways and they're not necessarily uh, planar, but the fundamental unit is planar. Okay. For the, uh, for the dips, that's a very different story because um, it's, it's uh, the, the infrared carriers and the uh, dip carriers may be related, but doesn't need necessarily need to be the same species. They just could be related, like C60 and C60+. You know, it could change in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of um, a charge state. It could change in terms of the number of hydrogens that are uh, uh, attached to it. But it could also change because the pHs have been converted into, uh, into clusters. The, the key thing is that they have to be fairly stable. Mm -hmm. and I, but I think that a three-dimensional cluster could be very stable, as long as it has more than probably 30 carbon atoms. Well, speaking of charge, next question is about that. Um, would you consider multiply charged fullerenes to be possible carriers, uh, carrier species of C60? For example, C62+, plus, as question by Jess Palco. Uh, I think so, yeah, I think that uh, the, the first ionization potential is about 7.4 EV, I believe, for the, the fullerene. So I think the second one would be about uh, 10, uh, 10 point something. Yeah, I, I don't have it on the top of my head here. So yes, you could doubly ionize it. Okay. I, I, I don't um, think you could triply ionize it. I think the third uh, ionization potential would be above 13.6 EV, which is the highest ionization limit, and you don't have many of those photons around. All right, so I have um, two more questions, two last questions, actually. Um, so, uh, German says, um, thank you very much for interesting talk. Have you studied open shell or ionic pHs? 
um, with and how many corrections? Meaning, have you done that? We Obviously, have yeah. um, uh, studied um, uh, with DFT, but we have not measured their spectrum uh, in the lab yet. Uh, all of the spectra they showed were done by Vivian Jan uh, Puma and his group were uh, molecular beam uh, spectra. And so they were, uh, um, uh, they were not ionized. I see. That's clearly a, a, a challenge for the, for, uh, the next uh, couple of years. And one final question from Martin Baer. Um, would a very broad feature like the absorption of a metal complex in the visible range with a width of 50 nanometer be identified at all in the spectra of interstellar clouds? And well, that's, uh, that's a very tough challenge um, uh, because it means that you need to have a, uh, a very um, a stable uh, baseline. Right. And uh, people have looked for structure and they have found some structure and uh, there is a knee uh, that is well known due to excess absorption. Uh, that is the well known 2175, right. uh, 271 uh, nanometer uh, uh, broad absorption uh, feature uh, that, that's present. Um, uh, it's just a very tough thing to do. Not impossible. I think the challenge here is uh, not, the challenge is not in measuring it in the lab, the challenge is not in measuring it in space, but the challenge is in convincing an astronomer that is interesting to observe. <laughs> okay, well, I, I guess he had a follow-up question, but you have answered it. How would you, uh, how would we identify such species? But I, I guess he just answered the challenge, the cha answered the challenges. So at this point, we are a bit over, over time. And this is when I'm going to um, ask everybody to please um, give a round of applause to both our speakers. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Xander, for giving us your valuable time. And thank you, everybody who joined. Um, please uh, come back again next month. Um, and uh, we will have another um, seminar next month. Uh, we will. We will uh, announce the dates and the speakers uh, soon in our website, as well as via email and various social media platforms. Uh, so keep an eye. Come back to our website for uh, the recordings of this seminar and, and the seminars that, is going to, that are going to happen in future. Um, and, um, and do please do uh, tell others, your colleagues, um, to join us next time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Xander. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everyone, for joining. This has been great. Thank you.